have a more runny nature to their excrement. I'm trying to be as tactful as I can. Can you tell? Hey guys, welcome to Three Mississippi. Sid here, and as you can see, I am wearing my crazy bird shirt, which only can mean we are gonna talk about crazy birds today. We're gonna talk about some different breeds that we like to raise for sustainability and to make us a little more self-sufficient. We're gonna share some of those little bits of information with you. I also wanna share a product that I found that is going to help with your outdoor animals tremendously. prices going up the way they've been going up and things looking the way they've been looking lately, I'm sure that being a little bit more self-sufficient and a little bit more sustainable has probably been on your mind. And if it hasn't, it should be. I'm going to share with you guys some of the animals that we have raised in the poultry and fowl umbrella that have really made us feel a little bit better about our ability to be self-sufficient and why. We all know things have been crazy the last few years and more and more people have gotten into farming and homesteading and learning about being a little bit more self-sufficient. I encourage this 110%, guys. I think that learning to raise your own meat, learning to grow your own food is important. As Mike would say, go grow some food, guys. But for me, my passion does not lie in the lettuce, okay? I love to eat it, but I don't like to grow it. My passion are the cluckers, the quackers, the squawkers, those little guys. That's what I love. And that's what I'm gonna to talk to you guys about. But before we get into all that, you gotta think about how you're gonna be raising your birds too, the conditions they're gonna be in. Nature has a lot of bugs and poultry in particular are really susceptible to things like mites and fleas and things like that. Their coops, no matter how often you clean them out, which is important to do or how you tend to them, they can still get messy, dirty. They can still get an infestation of mites, especially in this heat. So take a look at this product because I think you guys might like it. So Primo Guard was nice enough to send me a couple of different products that they have uh, so that I can try them out on our coop and on some of the animal bedding and on the animals directly. Now, luckily right now, I don't have any issues with mites or lice on any of my poultry. But as we all know, in the warmer summer months, that can definitely start to become an issue. Now granted, our coop is brand new and I clean it daily. Staying on top of the cleanliness of your coop is always part of an issue when it comes to keeping your mites and your pests down in your poultry flock, but they can still pop up. It happens to the best of us. Even when we supply an area for dust baths and that kind of thing, there can still be an issue with that, especially as the weather heats up. So this Primo Guard, there's the pet spray, uh, pet protector spray, and then the poultry spray. They basically have the same ingredients. It's just clove oil and cottonseed oil, all natural ingredients, and they are made in the USA, which as you guys know, we love. We love products that are made in the USA. We love to support that. <laughs> um, and so having something that's all natural uh, to use on my birds when they do have an outbreak of mites or things like that is amazing. This works to uh, help with the mites, fleas, ticks, and lice. And uh, this is also gonna help with repelling and protecting against mites, fleas, ticks, and mosquitoes. Now, the nice thing about both of these is you can spray them directly on your animals. So Bunko, for example, um, he a lot of times, even though I have him with a little tick collar on, since he's outdoor only, uh, our barn cat here, um, he still does sometimes get ticks on his tush. And so I've been spraying down his hind quarter area to help kind of prevent him from getting ticks and things on his bum and bites from fleas and whatever um, and so far so good um, I haven't had any issues with him scratching biting or, or seeing any ticks on him on his hind quarter like I normally do this is also safe to spray inside your coop on your rungs in your nesting boxes um, in your cat or dog's bedding so you just a fine mist you don't need to saturate it just a fine mist over it to get it nice and wet and on there uh, to help repel and kill those mites and bugs that are on there that we want to keep off of our animals to keep them healthy and comfortable and this uh, 
Primo Pet Protectant and Primo Poultry Spray are both going to help with that. And like I said, so far so good. Luckily, I don't have any issues with my poultry right now, um, which that's always a good thing. But using this in the coop as a preventative, I think is going to be wonderful as well. I have sprayed down the inside of the coop and the bedding, and I'll continue to do that um, to ensure that it stays nice and clean and fresh and bug free to the best of my ability. And uh, this one, the pet protectant spray, um, I've sprayed down this couch behind me here. That is that blanket right there, that buffalo plaid, that's where Bunko likes to sleep 90% of the time. And so I've sprayed down that whole area. Again, not saturating it, just getting that fine mist over it and getting it in there and kind of help protect uh, us from when we sit on them, from picking up anything that he's left there and keep him from rolling around in any mites or ticks that maybe have landed there. So again, guys, I'm super happy about this. When you spray it in your coop or anywhere near your animal bedding or whatever, make sure that you're pulling the food and water, um, that you're not spraying it into them. Obviously not in their face or you know any areas that are sensitive, uh, open sores or anything like that. You wanna make sure you're not spraying it into. You don't wanna be ingesting it or rubbing it into your eyes, but it is natural products. They are again made in the USA, which we absolutely love. Uh, we love love that about it. Um, so if you're curious, if you're having an issue with your uh, poultry or your outdoor or indoor pets, uh, picking up any critters that you don't want to, give this a shot, guys. Uh, it's got a very pleasant, mild smell. It's not perfumey. It doesn't smell chemically. It just smells very faintly of, I would say, of clove. Um, cause that's always something I look for too, especially on my outdoor animals, cause I don't want them to smell like bait, uh, to larger predators. Um, so the fact that it's got very mild to no scent is always a plus, I think. And this is, this is good stuff. So there's a link down below that you can click if you want to go get some for your own poultry or outdoor pets. I'm going to try using it on my goats. Um, goats a lot of times have issues with mites and things because of the nature of their, their coats being so coarse. Uh, they love to pick up mites and things and have issues with that since they don't really give themselves dust baths You really have to kind of stay on top of that. So something like this that you can spray on them almost like you would uh, With a horse with fly spray kind of spraying them down a little bit and and getting it on them I think this is going to be a great thing for that They also have this primo mite killer that you can use on your bedding It's child and pet friendly indoor outdoor use as well um, again, luckily, I don't have any infestations of this right now, um, but I'm hanging on to this for if and when I do. Hopefully never. Hopefully I would never need this, but, you know, sometimes things happen, especially out in the country. We are always finding new bugs. Every couple of weeks, there's a new bug that's trying to kill us, I find, in the country. So having something like this uh, in your back pocket that's that's safe and, and natural is, is always a good thing. Um, again... There's a link down below with a promo code for you guys if you want to give it a try for yourself. This, this poultry spray and the pet protector from Primo Guard, I am very excited about. The other nice thing is there is no downtime. You don't have to wait for it to clear their system to eat their eggs or anything like that. It's totally safe, just like it's safe to use in their coop um, and just like it's safe to use directly on them. So give it a try. Like I said, so far so good. I've been using it in the coop and using it on Mr. Bunko and haven't had any issues with it and seems to be doing doing the trick for Mr. Bu Mr. Bunko, keeping the, the ticks and things off of him. So that's exciting for me. I love to share stuff with you guys that's natural and made in the USA when we find it. So if that's something that interests you, go check it out for your flock. They're so cute. I love a good Muscovy. Guys, these are my Muscovy ducklings. I've got a dozen of them. Uh, in the brooder still. As you can see, they're getting pretty big. They're starting to feather out and pretty soon they'll be outside. They are off of heat already. Almost a month old, just coming up on a month now. And guys, Muscovies are an amazing bird to raise. Let me tell you why. We all know prices have been going up a lot lately and it's not going to get any better anytime soon. So being able to be a little bit more sustainable and self-sufficient is always a plus and it should always be a goal to whatever degree you're capable of doing. For those of you that have been following us for a while, you know that we started out in California on a really small farm and we tried to maximize our space with animals that we could turn over quickly and animals that would make sense in our little ecosystem that we had developed. So we'll start out with Muscovies. Muscovies are a wonderful duck. They are a bush duck. They are a wonderful meat duck. Now they are seasonal egg layers, so they are not great if you are really into duck eggs and baking and having prolific, uh, you know, constantly having duck eggs. This is not 
the duck that you want because you're only going to get, you know, a few eggs out of them during the laying season. However, they are amazing at a lot of other things. Muscovies are quiet, not like these geese behind me. They are super, super quiet. They actually don't quack. They hiss, they chirp. Uh, usually the chirping is reserved to uh, just the hens when they have ducklings and the ducklings when they're little. Um, but typically you don't hear a peep out of them. They are super quiet. And a lot of people's complaint about ducks is that they're very loud and boisterous. I don't like my geese are being right now. But with the Muscovies, that part is kind of eliminated. Muscovies are a bush duck, which means that they don't really need much water. Now with all waterfowl, they do need to clear their sinuses. So I always make sure that they have kind of a water trough or a small kiddie pool pond situation. Uh, this is mainly used to, like I said, clear their sinuses. And oftentimes uh, during the spring season when, you know, they're in the mood and the temperature's right, and uh, they have some, some things that they like to do as tradition post-coital. Uh, let's say they like to take a little bath afterwards. That's just part of their drill. And so uh, having that available to them, especially during mating season, is an extra added little bonus. But you don't need a large body of water. Uh, I use a small little trough that I fill up for them, and that works just fine. Now, Muscovies will lay several clutches during the season if you let them. So for example, with my Muscovies that we have raised in the past, uh, I would sometimes out of each hen get about three hatch groups out of them. Um, and now for Muscovies, they have a 35 day, roughly, give or take, uh, incubation period that they're gonna be sitting on those eggs. So building up to their egg count, usually it's somewhere around typically between like 11 to 18 has been has been the average that I've seen. It takes them a little while to build up those those eggs, a couple weeks typically, so they will start laying their eggs and they'll just kind of have them in that holding pattern while they kind of build their nest around it for those a couple weeks while they're laying those eggs. Sometimes if you've got a, a few hens, they'll lay together and kind of co-nest, that's always nice too. And they are great moms, guys. These guys will sit on those eggs and they raise them up and they are amazing. So it's really nice because you don't have to have an incubator. They will sit on those eggs. They love to sit. They will, they will do their thing. Now, interesting fact, guys, a lot of people don't realize and they worry about their hens when they get broody or when they're sitting on a clutch because they think, oh, well, they're not eating and drinking and they're not doing this or that. Well, if you've been around poultry or waterfowl for any length of time, you know that when they sit on a nest, they don't need as much. They're, they've regulated themselves, and we won't get into the, the science of all of that and geek out on you too much right now, but basically is they will eat a little bit if they're offered it, they will, they will take it, um, and they will get off the nest and take kind of a break once in a while when they feel they need to and go have some water and go maybe grab a bite of food, but then they're right back to that nest. Now, oftentimes people get concerned during this time too because they'll see the animal get up, Sorry guys, this is gonna get gross. They're going to have explosive expulsion. Um, I call it nesting butt. Uh, when they're sitting like that, a lot of times birds will defecate where they are sitting, but when they're on a nest, uh, they won't. They will hold it, so to speak. And because their nutrition is a little bit different during that time, uh, because they are sitting, they have a more runny nature to their excrement. I'm trying to be as tactful as I can. Can you tell? Anyway, uh, so a lot of people worry that their animals are sick. This is totally normal. I've heard it referred to as lots of different things. I personally, you know, I call it nesting butt, um, but it's just, it is what it is and it smells lovely. Let me tell you, it's a different smell than their normal stuff. So just be aware that if you have your duck sitting on a clutch, that that's not the end of the world. Uh, it is totally normal and usually audible. So something to look forward to. Muscovies have amazing meat, guys. They are like steak when you cut them open. They have this beautiful dark meat. Uh, one of our favorite things to do with the Muscovy meat is to cure it actually. And it's wonderful. It's like the most amazing cured meat that you've ever had in your life. It beats prosciutto. It beats pork belly cured. It beats everything. It is legitimately, I would say, the best 
you will ever have of cured meats that I've ever tasted anyway. It's amazing. And of course you can just, you know, cook the breasts and do all that as well. That's, I'm sure there's a million different duck recipes that you can do uh, with them. I know there is, but they are wonderful for their meat. So typically, like I said, when they have these large clutches, you're not going to want to just keep all of these ducks around. Let's say your hen laid a clutch of 18 and hatched them all out successfully and she's raising them up in the yard. She will fiercely protect them. She will sit on the nest with them until they're about two days old and all hatched before she starts venturing them out for food and water. Um, as we've mentioned in previous videos with questions of incubation and eggs, uh, when chicks and fowl hatch, they have 72 hours. That's three days of nutrition that they've stored up from the remainder of the yolk from when they hatched. So they don't need any food or any water for those first three days. So typically mamas will wait till two or three days after everybody is hatched to take them and start venturing them out. This ensures that they are completely fluffed out and dried and that they're stable enough to keep up with mom and have their feet under them in order to like really book it through the yard if they need to. So what we've done in the past with our Muscovies is when they've hatched out a clutch, I let them all grow up. I will typically keep some of the females uh, to continue to use as breeders. Uh, I will sell off some and then the boys I will process out. I do generally like to keep only one male Muscovy as my dominant male. Before when I was raising them in California, I had one that was my good breeder. He was super gentle, good with the girls, never bothered the ducklings, uh, would protect them and was a great dad. Like he sent those child support payments on time. He was a good dad. Like he was at every little league game. He was a good one. Okay. So he was my, my big papa. Uh, he, his name was Dr. Drake Grimore. You know, if you know, you know who that is. Leave it in the comments below. But uh, Dr. Drake there would, uh, <laughs> would be a great dad. And he was my only breeder. Every other male that we hatched out, if I didn't sell it, we processed and used the meat. I'm not saying you have to do that. I'm just saying that just like roosters, uh, if they are not raised up together, they will typically fight. Also to keep in mind, and I definitely noticed this in my experience, that once the males matured and tried to exhibit dominance over the flock, um, they would typically start fighting, uh, the father and the son. So I found it best to just eliminate that and get the sun out of there. If you're in an area where your winters aren't very harsh, it's really easy to have these birds on their own lay clutches anywhere from February through October. So you're really only looking at like three to four month window where they're really not laying at all and you're not going to have any ducklings provided the weather is cooperating. I've had my girls kind of stop laying after they've had their last clutch in the beginning of summer. They will not lay for a little while and then again in the beginning of the fall I've had them start laying again. So every, every you know, flock is a little bit different. There's, you know, weather factors, diet factors, environment that, that all take part in that. But just keep in mind that they are definitely seasonal layers. Um, you are not going to get eggs all year round. One of the best things about Muscovy, besides the fact that their meat is amazing and that they are excellent parents, they are actually really good at pest control, guys. They eat flies and little flying gnats out of the air. Now your chickens and things are not going to be eating flies. They're going to be eating crawling bugs and things on the ground. We all have, we have our birds for different things. You know, you got your guineas for your ticks and you got your you know, your peafowl for your ticks and your snakes and things like that, right? But these Muscovies, they'll eat your flying bugs and they love it. Now I've had my chickens go after some flying beetles and things like that and moths and stuff I've seen them go after, but not as often. But the great thing about Muscovies is they love eating flies. They will help keep the flies down in the area, which is a wonderful thing. So that's why I really like Muscovies as far as ducks go, because it's an excellent source of meat. Um, they do grow out relatively quickly to maturity where you can start processing them out. You know, usually about five months in or so, um, they're at the point where you could probably think about processing them. Again, everybody grows a little bit differently and if it's a male or female, um, but you know, somewhere between the four to six month mark is probably safe that, to say that you could, you could go ahead and, and process them out. So with the way they eat bugs, the way they reproduce with no issues, I really do love the Muscovies. I think they're wonderful. 
And I always tell people that they are the best ducks to have if you're looking for something that's just gonna continue to do its own thing with really no intervention on your part. They will continue to breed, they will continue to lay their own clutches, they will continue to raise them up, and you won't have to really do anything and you will continue to get meat out of them. But ducks are not the only sources of meat that we rely on when it comes to fowl. Quail is another one that we have done before that we love and we'll get into again. We just haven't started back on them yet. They are amazing guys. Quails are quick turnarounds. Now, a, a cage for them is pretty easy to put together. Uh, if you wanna just be raising them for meat and eggs, you do not need a flight pen. So just even a, a small, almost like a, a flat chicken tractor rabbit hutch situation that's like on the ground is perfect for them as long as it's, you know, pretty predator proof, um, but that's gonna be true for any animal uh, habitat. They are great guys because they, once you start incubating those eggs, <clears throat> they only take uh, a couple of weeks to incubate, usually somewhere between the 14 to 18 day mark is all it takes for them. And it, a lot of times it's, I mean, it's fast. So they're, they, I've had them hatch on day 12 and 13 before. Um, they are just itching to get out of those shells. And then they reach maturity so quickly. Guys, they start laying eggs eight weeks later. They are so, 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 so fast. And they are not very loud. The roos can get a little bit loud, especially if you've got a lot of them. Um, so sometimes you do want to think about maybe separating them if you have too many, you know, separate your breeders, your breeder males from your, from your hens. But man, you're going to get eggs constantly. And those eggs pack so many wonderful vitamins. They are they're higher in all nutrients and everything than just your regular chicken egg. When you're talking size, as far as filling you up, it takes three quail eggs to basically equal one chicken egg. Have your breeder ruse, collect those fertile eggs, throw them in the incubator. Two weeks later, you got new birds starting. You process out, you know, your, your males out of that group that you don't want to keep and you've got all this meat now. Now, for some people, quail can be a little bit trickier because a lot of people are really confused about what to do with quail meat because, you know, you're talking a very little bird. You're typically not making the same types of meals that you would with a chicken or whatever, even though the flavor of the bird is not too far different than chicken. Um, I would say it's a little different, a little hard to describe the difference if you've never had it, but um, you just have to be really looking at those recipes and, and figuring out ways to do them. I, so far, my favorite way to do them, and you might laugh, but it's been in my Instapot, in my pressure cooker. I've done them in the oven. I've done them on the pan. I've done them on the grill. I know a lot of people like to grill them or smoke them. Um, they cook quickly. They're little, um, but in the pressure cooker, oh, they're just so tender and wonderful. So a lot of people are intimidated by the, the way you have to cook quail. Uh, because they are so small and can get tough or overcooked so easily, uh, really don't be scared. If you've got an Instapot, <laughs> you can you can make some, some pretty good quail. And if you haven't had a pickled quail egg, you haven't lived yet. Because I don't like regular pickled eggs, but pickled quail eggs, they're my jam. Quail are awesome for your sustainability too, just like the Muscovies are. Uh, only you don't even need as much space as you would need with the Muscovies because they're so small and you can keep them in smaller pens. Uh, they don't need a lot of room. These are not birds that, that you have to have a flight pen for or that have to be out grazing or anything like that. You can do fodder trays for them if you like. They're very quiet. There's a quick turnaround and prolific layers. Um, now granted, their lifespan is a lot shorter. So that is something to consider. While a Muscovy duck, can live, you know, just like a chicken, they can live, you know, five to 10 years. Um, and you've got your, your quail that are really maxing out at about a year and a half of their productivity when it comes to laying and all of that. Um, so usually by the two year mark, you want to make sure you've got fresh blood in there for your breeders and you do have to keep an eye on that rotation. So when it comes to that, there is that little extra bit added pain of you got to renew your stock a little bit more frequently but if you stay on top of it it's really not that bad but it is des definitely something to keep in mind because you know part of being sustainable and and self-sufficient is knowing that hey these guys are going to stop laying and they're just going to die because they're getting old you know um and i know that sometimes quail can can live you know five years or so but Typically, the slowdown time is about a year and a half to two years. You start seeing the dramatic drop off, and then usually they don't live a whole lot longer, um, in my experience and in the experience of a lot of 
quail people that I have spoken to in the past, that has been the case. Um, so anyway, just something to keep in mind that you do want to be cycling through them. You do want to make sure that you're getting, you know, a few new laying hens uh, into the group for breeding and a new uh, roo in there for breeding that you like so that you can make sure that you're, you're keeping your stock going. But man, to be able to go out in the backyard, pull a duck, pull some quail, and make dinner, forget about it. If you look behind me guys, you can see our chicken tractor right there. We started it out up here and we have been moving it down there and over and now it's coming back up the hill. Uh, they've been out there for a little while now. My geese are talking to me. They've been out there a little while now and they're getting closer and closer to that harvest date. Now here's the thing about Cornish Cross. They are not sustainable. You cannot take these guys and breed them and make more. Now let me explain a little bit. <laughs> because some people will fight me in the comments. These are a crossed breed of chicken, bred in a way that they are going to be genetically larger. They do not have sustainability in the sense that you can breed them. Oftentimes they won't live long enough to reach sexual maturity. They have many issues when it comes to their legs and their hearts, and a lot of times both can give out if they get very big very quickly. Now I have found that pasturing them does give them a lot more longevity versus keeping them penned up in like a warehouse situation where they are literally just strapped to a feed bin and eating corn all day. This does make a difference. In fact, I even did a test a few years ago where I let some of my Cornish hold over for an entire year and they lived and the women started laying eggs, but I did not incubate any of them. They're more prone to have a lot of defects because of the way they are crossbred. Uh, it's an issue. It's not something that you can do with these particular birds. Now, there are a lot of birds that are wonderful for meat and are sustainable, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But why do we still do Cornish if they're not sustainable and we have to buy new batches every year? And maybe why you should be starting out with Cornish instead for yourself as well. If you're able to pasture them, Cornish are a great option. Now, let me tell you why. You make your investment, you use scraps, you get whatever other materials and labor that you have to put into making your tractor. But once you've made your tractor, you've got your tractor. That cost is now not going to be an issue next year or the year after. You may have to make some repairs through the winter or whatever, but this thing isn't going to be that bad. Now these guys are only going to be out to pasture for a month, maybe two, when it's all said and done. These meat birds grow so quickly, at four weeks old, they are ready to go out to the pasture. Now we all know regular chickens that you raise, your laying hens, they're almost never ready to go out to the coop at four weeks old, let alone out in the pasture doing their thing and looking like actual birds out there, right? Because they grow so quickly, it's a quick turnover when it comes to that. So you order your chicks from a, from a reliable hatchery. These guys happen to be from McMurray. Um, and at four weeks, they go out to pasture. Uh, and then at eight weeks, you may have some that are big enough to process out, depending on the sizes that you want to do. You know, if you're doing game hen size, if you're doing, you know, roasters or broilers or, you know, however you want to do it. I typically, if we're doing large batches, now this year we did a much smaller batch. We only did 50. In years past, we've done hundreds of birds throughout the season. So oftentimes what we would do is we would do some at the four to six week mark. We would do some at the eight to 12 week mark. We would do some at the 16 week mark. And then some of my slower growers, oftentimes my females, we would do eh, sometimes closer to 20 weeks, depending. Now, I know that's going to sound crazy to you, but we have always fed and our birds a little differently and pastured them differently. So they do take a little bit longer to grow out typically. Then you'll hear people say like, oh, you know, I process all mine in eight weeks. They're probably feeding them straight corn. And that is fine if that's what you choose to do. Uh, you can 100% do that. We don't do that um, and a lot of times those birds are also not being pastured so they're going to be in a more confined space so they're basically going to just be you know essentially sitting on the couch eating bonbons and gaining weight for you in a very rapid way versus them being out in the pasture and being more active now i like these birds for people that are beginning with chickens uh, as far as the meat part of it goes because 
if they decide to process these out, it's a one and done. You're not trying to figure out your breeders. You're not trying to reserve any of your stock. You're simply processing them out once they're big enough to the size that you want. And that can make it a lot easier for somebody who's not sure if this is even for them, if they've never processed out a, processed out a bird before. Um, it can be a little bit intimidating processing your first animal. That is one of the reasons too why I love telling people to start with quail because it's a smaller bird, it's easier to manage. Uh, in some ways it's actually harder for some people to process it out. Uh, I think men sometimes with bigger hands have a hard time with the processing the little quail. Um, for me it's really easy because my hands are little. It's an easier place to start because once you process them all out, you don't have anything left. So if you do it and you're like, you know what, this is not for me, I don't wanna do this again, you're not dealing with a reserve of you know, breeding stock that you will have with some other breed. Now these guys are not sustainable, like I mentioned in this way, because they're not going to be bred back to each other and we're not gonna be incubating their eggs and hatching out babies because that would be a risk of a lot of deformities and a lot of heartache. And quite frankly, a waste of time and money. There are many other breeds that are great options if you're wanting something to have a breeding stock of that you can then raise and pasture for meat as well. Typically these are gonna be a little bit more uh, slow to grow, whereas these guys are sort of scientific anomalies. We have done Freedom Rangers or Red Rangers, you'll hear them referred to in the past. We personally did not care for them. Um, they are good little layers. We have done the, uh, the Dark Cornish. Not a big fan of those guys. Uh, we didn't care for their meat. We didn't care for the way they grew out. I am, however, really wanting to try out some American Bresse. Um, they are uh, the American version of the French Bresse. And again, while a little bit more slower growing, just got bit by an ant really hard. Um, <laughs> still trying to get me. I must be standing in an ant hill. That's fun for me. I love that for me. I've actually been trying to get my hands on some American Bresse for a couple of years now and haven't been able to, but I'm hoping that this year is going to be the year because uh, they are supposed to be one of the best tasting chickens that you will ever have in your life. They are sustainable, so I can keep a breeding flock of them and continue to have my own chicks every year after I incubate my eggs versus Cornish where I have to buy chickens, chicks every year to be able to raise them out. Now it would add an extra step for me having to incubate a few rounds of eggs, but that is a minimal cost compared to having to order chicks. But here's the thing, even if you're having to order a batch of chickens every year, these birds do not cost very much to raise. Once you've invested in your basic setup, like your warming plates or your heat lamp, uh, we know how I feel about heat lamps, but warming plates uh, <laughs> and your waters and your stuff, once you got your basic setup for brooding birds, that initial investment, while it's going to be a little bit more, over time, your start over time in the spring is gonna be less and less. So even if you decide to do Cornish continually because you don't wanna to have to mess with incubating eggs, Maybe you don't like it, maybe it's not your thing, uh, whatever the reasons. If you decide to go this route, your, your cost is still gonna be m minimal, okay? Because that couple dollars that you're spending on each chick that you're buying, they are so cheap to raise, you know, especially if you do the heat plates because you're only on them for a little while and they're so much more um, efficient when it comes to electricity. And so you're, you're not spending a lot of money, right, on that part of it. They're, they're out to pasture, so a lot of their feed is the pasture. So you're not having to supplement them with as much feed. So it's not going to cost you very much, and it's going to be cheaper in the long run. Maybe not the first year because you're having to buy a water and a plate and all these things that you're going to be using for years, okay? Your initial investment. Take that out of the factor. And if you're looking at your price per pound on your meat, you're going to be getting it more cheaply and better quality than what you would buy in the store. And you're not relying on a supply chain. I think if 2020 taught us anything, being that reliant on a supply chain for your food was not a good thing. Having it out your back door was the way to go. I didn't have to go to the grocery store. I didn't, I didn't go to the grocery store for a while when all of the craziness started because people were being crazy. Remember, I was in California at the time. People were being crazy, okay? So it was just easier to stay at home and 
just live off of what we had. And we did. So however you choose to do your birds, I completely 100% recommend getting started, even if it's small, because having that influx of meat, the ability to sell the offspring, the eggs, all of these things are, are such wonderful resources to have at your fingertips. Not to mention that if you've got kids, this is a great thing for them to learn about. It's good for them to learn how to process out their own meat. It's not for everybody. And I understand that. You might get your first batch of Cornish or your first, first batch of quail and go to process them out and you might be like, oh, this is not for me. I can't do this. Kudos to the people that can, but I cannot do it. That's cool. Maybe you're, you're the one that doesn't like to do it. Maybe your husband doesn't mind to do it. Um, you know, it's, it's a trade-off. There's always, there's always going to be some kind of, not everything is your jam. And I've been very open, just like how Mike gets so excited with the garden. I get so excited talking about birds and loving on birds and everything about birds. I love raising them. I love teaching about them. I love being around them. I love eating them. I love it all, okay? Birds are fantastic. There is nothing that I don't love about a bird. Okay, <laughs> they're fascinating creatures, they really are. So, but find the thing that's your jam when it comes to homesteading and sustainability and being more self-sufficient and being more prepared. You know, everybody kind of has their, their niche that they're really good at or that they're at least really interested in or that they're comfortable with. And not everybody's going to be comfortable with actually processing the meat. So finding somebody that you can trade that service with or, that is comfortable with doing it for you in exchange for some of the meat or some, however you want to work it out or maybe you're just paying them i don't know but there are there's there's ways to do it you know or maybe you find that it's really not for you at all you really hate raising it maybe you find somebody else that can raise the meat and you'll you'll raise the vegetables i mean work out within your community find somebody that's able to do that mike and i are very lucky because he's really good at the gardening as you know he gets very excited about the gardening and i am like Give me all the animals. I will, I will do all the animal things, you know. <laughs> so, and where his he's like, I don't really want to do with the animals. He's fine processing them, um, and we have processing days where you know mainly because it just goes faster if you've got two of you doing it, or or even now Frankie kind of gets in on the act and helps us. But it, when you got a little bit of an assembly line going, it really does kind of move it along a little bit faster and make it a little bit easier. You know, obviously there's lots of categories when it comes to being sustainable or being more self-sufficient, but I think being able to feed yourself uh, is pretty high on the list. And if you can sell some of these animals to make a profit, that's fantastic. Uh, if you can sell the meat, that's fantastic. You can eat the meat, that's fantastic. You can eat the eggs, that's fantastic. You are knocking one little section out that you can take care of for yourself and once you kind of feel what that feels like if you've never done it i can't describe the feeling to you but it's just that that feeling of a little bit of independence and being able to to do something on your own is such a great feeling and to be able to teach that to your kids and share it with your spouse or your family uh it's it's a it's a game changer so I just, I get really excited about it because I love the fact that when we started this lifestyle years ago and started our little farm uh, almost a decade ago now, I was fired up about it. I didn't really know exactly what I was doing when we started, <laughs> um, but I have learned and I have figured it out and, uh, and I love it. And I love sharing what I've learned with others. Um, and, and there's just so many wonderful facets to being self-sufficient and doing things on your own and learning and, and, and sharing it that, that I think that I just want everybody to do it to whatever degree they can. Even if you're in a high rise apartment, I want you to have some herbs growing on your windowsill. I don't care. I want you to do something. I want you to build a pantry. I want you to like, when I say build a pantry, I mean like stock your pantry with good stuff that's going to get you through even in your apartment. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, man, that's what you got to do. Now that we've shared with you why we do some of the birds that we do here around the farm and why we've done them in the past and why we're going to do them again, I hope maybe it inspires you to figure out which animal in the poultry family will be your jam, which one is going to be the one that you really feel passionate about and that you want to give a try. Um, feel free to ask me any questions. I love talking about my Muscovies. I love talking about quail. I don't have any at the moment, but I have raised them for a few years. 
and we will be getting them again. So I am excited to share what I have learned about them, how wonderful they are. And then of course, raising meat chickens. We've done this for quite a while now and we love raising our meat chickens. And like I said, we've done several different kinds and we are excited to continue to do that every year. So I, I hope that it, it gets you excited about maybe trying your hand at raising your own meat because it is not that hard. People think it's so like, oh, I can't do that because that's something that I just buy at the grocery store. You 100%, 100% can process a bird. I could process a bird right now. I mean, people look at me sometimes and they think I don't look like I could do these things, but I 100% do. <laughs> and I 100% love it. There is nothing better than processing day and getting all that meat in the cooler and then, you know, packaging it all up in the shrink bags and, and filling your freezer. And then, you know, we had a poultry business back in California and we sold that, those, those, those birds once they were processed out. And man, it's the best. I highly recommend it. I love it. And guys, don't forget that link down below, that PermaGuard, uh, good stuff. I've been using it now for a couple of weeks. I've been using it on, uh, on Bunko. He has not gotten any more ticks and I've been using it on in the in the coop and and uh, on the uh, the bedding on the patio for Bunko and I have not had any little mites or or any issues like that and and this stuff this stuff seems to be pretty good vets are recommending it now saying that they've given their thumbs up to it and I can tell you that now after using it for a couple of weeks I do see an improvement in uh, you know him getting the occasional tick uh my, my barn cat here getting the occasional tick and these uh the, the coop staying clean so so far so good on all that guys so don't forget if you're interested in it check the link down below and that promo code uh to get your own bottle and it will be good stuff thanks for hanging out with me guys i appreciate you i hope maybe you learned something maybe you just enjoyed the crazy bird lady talking about her crazy birds either way I'm happy to share it with you. Until next time, guys, safety's off.